Hey guys, welcome to yet again another episode of Funeral Home Talk with Anai. Yay! So on this episode, before I jump into the very interesting story that I have, I did want to answer two questions that were brought up last week. Um, The first one being, are my stories true? Or are they fake? Am I making them up? To answer that question, no, all of my stories are true. Now, the only thing fake about my stories are the names of the people that I use, and I only change them for their protection. Other than that, everything that I witnessed is true. Every story that I share is very, very true. Second question, can I share my story? Can I write to you, and will you be willing to share my story? Yes, absolutely. My podcast is open to anybody if you want to come and share your story or if you want to write to me and have me share your story, I would love to. I feel we all have a voice for a reason and that reason being is to use it and to hopefully be heard by the right people. With that being said, let's jump right into it. Now. This story was told to my best friend and I, my best friend who I call sister. Sister, if you're listening, Wally still owes me wings. Insider. Anyway, so this story was told to my sister and I. We used to work together. This was the third funeral home that I worked for. It was told by the pre-need arrangers. So pre-need is basically what it sounds like, pre-arrangements. So if you're alive and well, or even if you're not all that healthy, you have the right to go to a funeral home of your choice and pre-plan your funeral. You can choose your casket, uh, your viewing, the church, if you have a church in mind where you want your service to take place. You can even go as far as to choosing the rabbi, the priest, the pastor, you can set it in stone with a funeral home. And it goes into an insurance fund. Why? Because that way, if the funeral home, one of the reasons why it goes into an insurance fund is if the funeral home were to close, they can always transfer that prearrangement to a different funeral home. Now, the beauty of having prearrangements is that the day that you do pass, no one in your family, and I mean nobody, can come in, including your toxic ex-husband or toxic ex-wife, can come in and say, well, I'm still legally married. I don't want him to have a a viewing. As a matter of fact, cremate him and dump him in the toilet. They can't do that. That's the beauty of it. Because like I mentioned before, there are laws in place that we have to abide by when it comes to a funeral. And one of those laws is who's responsible for the disposition of your body. So if you don't have any prearrangements, automatically, if you're married, the responsibility lies onto your spouse. If you're not married, then the responsibility goes down to your children if you have children over the age of 18. And the list goes on. It goes down to your parents, if not from there, your siblings, so on and so forth. If you don't have any prearrangements in place, whoever falls next in line can definitely say, you know what, I want him or her cremated. I don't want nobody in the family to view him or her. And after you cremate them, go ahead and scatter at sea. And at that point, we can't do anything. We have to abide by the law. So that's the beauty of having a prearrangement. Anyway, let's jump into it. Let's jump into my story. So this story was told to my sister and I by three pre-need arrangements. In that company, if you were a pre-arranger, you would also be there with the family for their viewing. So there was three people. Again, for their own protection, we'll call them Pancho, Fatima, and Gloria. So... Fatima and Pancho were in the chapel the whole time while the viewing is taking place. In this company, the viewing would be one day, usually in the afternoon, 
from about five to nine, usually four hours, the family would have to view the body and say their last goodbye. So again, those two were in the chapel the whole time, assisting families, just making sure if they needed tissue, they had tissue. If they needed water, that they would hand them water. And Fatima was in the, or I'm sorry, not Fatima, Gloria was in the reception area outside of the chapel. And she was outside. Why? Because there needed to be someone in the front, in the front desk, and so in case anybody walked in, they knew where to go. She can guide them to the chapel or if, you know, a walk-in that we call them were to walk in and ask for pricing, she can hand them what's called the general price list and basically give them an idea of what the prices were like at that funeral home. So one person always had to be in the front desk and two had to be in the viewing area. In this case, it was a chapel. Now, <laughs> funny enough, Gloria never saw the body. She never went in the chapel because she was so busy in the front assisting the families. So Fatima and Pancho were in the chapel. And after the four hours, you know, after handing coffee and water and donuts and sweet bread and all that, it's time to clean up. It's time to clean up. It's time to dismiss the family. So they get on the mic and, you know, hey, it's about that time. We have to get going. We have to close. Um, please make your way out. Well, Fatima and Pancho told Gloria, you know, we're going to go ahead and, and clean inside the chapel if you want to lock the door and all that stuff. Okay, cool. We made sure we checked the chapel. We checked everything. There's nobody left inside. All we have to do is just clean up the trash, vacuum, and we'll be on our way. Okay. So they locked the door. They went in the chapel. She Again, she stayed outside because she the restrooms obviously weren't in the chapel. So she had to throw the trash from the restroom and all that good stuff. Lo and behold, she's walking down this long hallway that leads to the restrooms and she sees a gentleman walking towards that direction. And she stops and says, um, excuse me, sir, but we're closed. You know, can you please make your way out? If you're going to use the restroom, make it quick. So she goes in the chapel and she tells the other two, hey, I thought you guys closed the door. I thought you guys locked it. And they looked at each other and said, yeah, we did. Remember, we verified with you. We said, okay, we're going to go in the chapel. We're going to finish cleaning here. Mind you, at this point, before they started cleaning, out of respect for the deceased, they would close the casket. You want to avoid any, you know, lint or anything getting in there. So the casket was closed. Gloria never seen the body. Okay, I keep referring to that for a reason. So. They tell her, you know, we'll check the restrooms one more time. But the gentleman, I mean, we didn't see anybody. But then again, we're in here. So we'll figure it out. Just give us a moment to clean. You know, if if it comes down to it, he could just walk out with us. Okay. The guy never came out. Never came out. Five, 10, 15 minutes went by. Nothing. They checked everywhere once again. And there was nobody there. So... The two that had been in the chapel the whole time asked Gloria, hey, Gloria, well, I mean, we didn't see anybody. And she said, no, I saw him because I was right walking right behind him, pretty much trying to chase him out, saying, excuse me, sir, you know, we're closed. Like, can you either, you know, cut it short in there or make your way out now? And so Fatima's light bulb goes off and she says, well, what did, what did the gentleman look like? And she said, well, he was, you know, yay high height. Um, he was, you know, kind of dark skinnish Hispanic male. And he had a dark blue suit on. That's all I can basically see from, you know, the backside of him. Fatima falls to her knees in the middle of the chapel and starts praying. Ave Maria, you know, sin pecado consentido. I mean, I don't really know how it goes. Padre Nuestro, all this good stuff, right? She just starts praying. And Pancho's looking like, 
oh heck no what is going on you just described the guy that's in the casket so at this point screw the trash and everything else they ran out they ran out they didn't even set the alarm and we know my sister and i know because the following morning when we went in there was no alarm to deactivate so they ran out they were like screw this place they all jumped in their car. Mind you, it's three different individuals. They all jump in the car. Pancho was so nervous and so shaken up that he backed his car into Gloria's car. It just became a big old mess. So much so that Gloria never came back to work. I mean, I don't blame her. I don't blame her. Even though she had never seen the body. How the heck were we going to know that, you know, homie needed to use the restroom one last time? That in itself was very, very crazy. And I got to admit, I was cracking up, cracking up when I heard the story. And I said, I, I have to share it one day. And here I am. I just have to share it with you guys. And that's nothing. I have another story that I feel that I want to share with you guys. So as my mom would say, Tan tan with that story. Now, this second story actually happened to me. I used to work in a funeral home out here in Torrance. And same thing. One time I stayed late for a viewing. I volunteered. Stupid me, right? So I volunteered and, you know, same thing. You have to serve the coffee and have water ready. Now, this funeral home was a little different than the one in L.A. that my sister and I worked for. This one, it was only two people on site. So we would be going in and out of the chapel, in and out of the reception area, making sure the coffee pot was always filled, all that good stuff. Okay. So... Same thing, you know, the viewing was about three, four hours. When the time comes, I like to get on the microphone. And when there's 10 minutes left, left, I like telling the family, you know, hey, we appreciate you guys taking the time to visit. However, this is a 10 minute mark. We will be closing in 10 minutes. And we do ask that at nine o'clock you make your way out. If there's anything you need at all, please find me in the front desk. I will be there. Happy to assist you. Okay. We like to give them time because you never know. They might have a long drive, might need to use the restroom, all that good stuff. Same thing. My coworker and I, we started cleaning. You know, we started taking out the trashes. I started wiping everything, vacuuming the chapel, making sure everything was secured. Obviously, before we before we would make our way out the door, we always wanted to make sure that any electronics were properly shut off and or disconnected. In this case, I disconnected the coffee machine. I suffer from OCD, so I feel like I have to disconnect everything because I imagine water hitting something and then somebody's going to get electrocuted or something's going to get set on fire. So I disconnected the coffee machine, which is really the only thing that we use during viewings. Um, we set the alarm. We made our way out. We turned off all the lights. I started hearing footsteps because, like I said, in, well, I didn't say it, but in this funeral home, we're in, in Torrance, it was a two-story funeral home. Upstairs, we had all the offices where everybody would be working and all that good stuff and then downstairs we had the chapel followed by a couple of viewing rooms so I started hearing you know footsteps and I said no 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 that's just my mind playing tricks on me I'm not gonna let that scare me or spook me I'm not gonna bust a bunch over there hitting people's cars so I made my way out as I'm getting into my car I don't know why. I should have never looked back, but I did. I looked back and I looked at the window that was kind of like the kitchen area or reception area, as they would call it. I looked at that window and I could have sworn I seen a guy in a black suit with like one of those red roses in their pocket. 
I can't. I don't know. I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it now.